Hello everybody, my name is Brady and we are back with another React video and today we're going to be checking out more Crash Course Geography, which I'm very excited about. As a lot of you know, I've been on a bit of a geography kick lately. I'm going to be checking out some new creators, geography related videos, and it's going to be really cool. Geography is something that I'm super into, but not very good at, and I'm not very good at getting good at geography. I've been trying. I, I really have. It's been a difficult process, but I'm hoping that if I start checking out more geography related videos, more of it's going to start sinking in. I think the vocabulary ends up throwing me off a whole bunch and a lot of the mapping stuff can be a little bit difficult for me to interpret, at least the more complicated stuff. That's why this video I'm very excited about because we're getting into what is a map. I've messed around with mapping and geography courses and stuff. I've done uh, some stuff on GIS software, which is just a fancy digital mapping thing. And I, I'm really into it, but it can be difficult. Uh, I, I don't want to say it can be difficult because it's like, maybe it's easier for everybody else. Maybe I'm just bad at it. But for me, it was a little difficult to do anything particularly extraordinary. Everything I did well was rather simple. So this should be really cool and I'm excited to talk about maps. I love maps. From espressos and cappuccinos to cafe au lait and plain black, there's a coffee out there for almost everyone. We can even visualize it on a map like this, where the color of each country represents how much coffee they drink per person. So much of the world loves coffee. And I agree. For me, there's nothing better than a morning latte. But for coffee to get to my favorite coffee shop, it first has to make it through a pretty long journey. I like that she opens up with, I'm not gonna say an unconventional map because it's a very conventional map. But the first kind of map that people tend to think of, or at least I tend to think of, is the map that gets you from point A to point B. Like you unfold the map and it's got all the roads and stuff on it and it's designed to get you from one place to another. Um, we either see it in paper form or we'll see it on our GPS. And I rarely have to deal with that sort of stuff. So it's weird that that hits me first because I'm much more likely to run into a map like this that expresses uh, like data points and stuff like that rather than just geographic locations one compared to the other, you know? Uh, so that's kind of interesting that that's the first thing that comes to mind because uh, I would definitely use a map like that way more. We won't go bananas and get into the full geographic story of coffee, but in 2020, coffee is mostly grown in the bean belt, which is, oh, I'll just show you. My favorite coffee shop is much closer though, over on Elm Street. From my house, take a left at the end of the street, go to the bottom of the hill, and take another left, past the house where the gray cat is always sitting on the porch. A few blocks later, there's that beautiful garden along the side of the yellow house. Walk past there, take a right at the next corner, and the cafe is straight ahead. At least that's the mental map I follow every morning. We all have maps we use as tools to help mm. us navigate or better understand where we are. And in geography, we use maps to study, analyze, and interpret spaces, places, and human environment interactions. We use maps in all shapes and sizes to tell the story of the Earth. They're colorful, detailed, and lots of times difficult to fold. Hmm. I'm Ali Zay Carrere, and this is Crash Course Geography. The opening is always so loud. Um, I gotta remember her name if I'm gonna keep watching these. Allie. Formally, a map is a symbolic representation of space, which is all the facts and features about a particular spot. Maps can be used to compare spaces and places on Earth and beyond, or shape our sense of reality. Like. So when you get into geography and stuff, one thing that I find a lot of the terminology is one of the things that I've struggled with more than anything else. Uh, I walk into my first geography class and the professor tells me to define space. What is space? And I'm just like, space? No, 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 space. Just, just everything around me and stuff and like it's such a simple concept that I find it difficult to break it down into a describable way and that's something that a lot of introduction courses will push you into not just in geography but a lot of subjects that I've taken they ask me to define very simple things things that I kind of take for granted and it's actually kind of difficult to be like how do I put into words and make it sound like at all intelligent and say, okay, what is space? Space seems like a very simple word. It seems like a self-defining word as far as I'm concerned. 
Like when you search map on the internet, this world map is one of the first that comes up. A world map is a type of reference map. Reference maps can show mountains, cities, mm. oceans, elevation, everything people might say, yep, that's there. But the Earth is almost spheroid or a slightly wonky sphere. So this reference map also wonky. has to do the hard work of representing our three-dimensional world in just two dimensions. Like taking the 3D Earth and squishing it onto paper or a flat computer screen. Ma yeah, I did a video on maps. We were just checking out fun maps from this article that I found on Vox. And uh, one thing that I talked about and I thought was really cool uh, was how we tried to get uh, take the globe and put it onto a rectangle and there are all sorts of problems that come with that that's a very interesting map the one that she put on there uh, it's got this little corner piece we, we got this little wonky thingamajig and like all different ways to try to interpret this space and make sense of it because it's really hard to get a sphere onto a rectangle it, it can be very difficult this one is all right there are some maps where uh countries they have their sizes uh, morphed uh, africa is one that like the whole continent sometimes is made a little bit smaller to compensate for the weird shape of the map and like h how that just doesn't exactly fit and africa has been one of the big victims of that often being made so small that you you don't realize it that it can hold like three united states i think people might say yep that's there but the earth is almost spheroid or a slightly wonky sphere so this reference map also has to do the hard work of representing our three-dimensional world in just two dimensions. Hmm. Like taking the 3D Earth and squishing it onto paper or a flat computer screen. Imagine doing that with a tomato. What a mess. For cartographers <laughs> or map makers, it's a challenge with many solutions. They need to pick which data they want to focus on, and the type of map they pick often depends on what story they want to tell. For example, we might want to use these three maps to talk about the number of people in each country around the world. They're thematic maps, which visualize data about a particular topic across a space. Instead of being something we'd use to navigate on a cross-country road trip, thematic maps tackle abstract ideas, like average rainfall or voting results by political party. So geography is one of those interesting subjects where I kind of understand why I struggle with it because I struggle with things like science and stuff. And this is kind of where a lot of science and social studies kind of meet in the middle in a lot of ways, depending on the kind of geography that you study. There's like human geography, which I would probably lean a little bit more towards. Uh, but there's also like physical geography stuff, which really leans in the uh, more scientific direction and explore how frequency, concentration, and patterns are distributed across a space. For example, these three thematic maps are designed to visualize population data. First, we hmm. have a chloropleth map, which shows how a theme like population changes over a particular space using different colors or shadings of colors. This is shown in the map's key or legend, which unlocks the map and shows us how to get into the map and interpret it. Notice so when I was doing some digital mapping, um, I was very new to it. I had to create a map that was kind of like this i, I kind of just had to color coat places uh properly and i made a big goof um i uh i decided i wanted my map to be super colorful and you know what if you want your map to be super colorful uh and you go from maybe from cool colors to warm colors you might be able to get away with that but what i did didn't really have any rhyme or reason to it. I just separated them into all different colors and thought it was okay. And then I looked at it and I was like, oh, this is so hard to follow. This is a good map. This is a good map. I, I think uh, from that point on, I ended up making them a little bit more like this. Just going from, use the same color with just different tints, which was uh, way easier to follow. Notice how the key moves from a light purple to a deep violet, depending on the this population density, the number of people per some amount of area. When we look at this, we can tell pretty quickly the population density in most of South America is quite low. Except for the northern tip of the continent, there are between 0 and 25 people per square kilometer. But wait, as of 2020, Sao Paulo in Brazil is actually one of the 20 most populated cities in the world. So nowhere in Brazil has more than 25 people per square kilometer? Nowhere? Chloropleth maps are useful That's, because they quickly yeah, tell us which countries uh, or regions belong in the same category overall. With a glance, we see Australia and Canada and Russia and most of South America all fit in the same population density category. But by shading a whole area, 
Chloroplast maps can make things look a little too simple, which can be a problem. Hey, when you have to break it down with uh, the very arbitrary borders that we have, like we have borders that uh, are very political, but they don't necessarily reflect things physically in on the earth. So I, I find that rather fun and I, I'm glad that she points this stuff out because we have places like over here in Russia we've got some decent population density but you might have like vast pieces of land throughout the country that has like nobody and that's what causes it to get such a light color so at least Canada another good example a lot of people are like down here and then you have a lot of spaces, uh, I, I, I'm pretty sure, like up here, that just don't have a lot of people at all. And that's what drags it towards this color. You could do a more broken down version of this map where you do it based on like uh, an extra layer of divides. Like with the United States, instead of just doing the whole country, you break it down into a state by state thing. And you'll probably get something very different. Russia and most of South America all fit in the same population density category. But by shading a whole area, chloroplast maps can make things look a little too simple, which can be a problem. They imply there's an evenness to whatever they're showing, even though there are parts of Sao Paulo with way more than 25 people per square kilometer mm. and other parts of Brazil with absolutely no people. Let's try a different thematic map that will let us be a bit Oof. more specific. A dot density map uses a dot to represent a key feature or attribute. I like this the one. cartographer decided that each dot on this map represents 100,000 people. So while the chloroplast map showed the general population spread out over an entire country, this dot density map has more granularity and shows where within a country people live, more or less. We can see the coasts of Brazil have more dots and more people. But take a look at the Sahara or Siberia. No one lives exactly where those dots are. The cartographer also decided where to place each dot to summarize population data. But it's a simplification that could mislead someone if they're not paying close attention, hmm. like we are. A dot doesn't necessarily mean 100,000 people live exactly there. Cartographers are always trying to make maps easily readable, but all the choices they make can influence accuracy. For example, if we changed how our dot density map is projected, or how the 3D Earth was flattened into 2D, the size and shape of the continents would shift, and so would the dots. We might accidentally imply some areas have a closer population density while others are more spread out. Our last thematic map for today is a cartogram Ooh, map, which uses size these. to compare data, like population density, regardless of the actual space these regions take up on the Earth's surface. With oh God, I have, there's a website you can go to where you can get all sorts of data for digital mapping and it will play out kind of like this. And I forgot what it was. But you can get all sorts of things. You can do like uh, trade, like imports and exports. You can search specific products and you can see uh, uh, which countries have more or less of that going on. And, and it's really cool. I love these that like morph the, uh, the size and just presence of a particular country based on like what it has. This one's population density, but uh, there's all sorts of... Uh, places you can go with that with this map the really populous countries are giant look at india ones with smaller populations Huge. Are teeny, but it looks weird to us or at least to me because we're used to maps that tell us something about the physical space that countries and continents take up india has a much bigger population but in real life australia is a much larger country it's about 7.7 .7 million square kilometers while india is less than half the size with 3.28 million square kilometers each of these thematic maps uses a different lens to tell the story of the world population Different maps represent data in different ways, and the more information a geographer has, the better interpretations they can make about a particular story. This is the population stuff I find very fun because I live in a very small state. Uh, I live in Rhode Island, which is the smallest state in the United States, uh, and we have about a, a million people. We'll, we'll say about a million people, and then... Uh, you would think since we are so small and like by a decent amount, uh, we would have way less people than a lot of places. And in a lot of cases we do, but then you'll look at a lot of uh, countries like further west uh, and you'll find a lot of them don't have the same population density we do among the United States. Our population density is actually decently high. Uh, and then we'll have some places that are way bigger and they'll have less than a million people, which is 
kind of interesting. Like we have a state like this that gets downplayed based on its size, but look at the amount of people we have compared to some other places. Like human population. Of course, there are many, many more stories to tell. So there are many, many more maps. And by helping us visualize data across space, pretty maps wing. actually shape our perception of reality that pretty too. Wing. All right, that sounds a bit melodramatic, but every map was made by a person making choices. And those choices, however thoughtful or simple or unintentionally biased, have an impact on how we imagine the world. Like we're so used to seeing north at the top of a map and south at the bottom. But why? Well, Doesn't that's have to a choice be that made way. by a cartographer. Other cartographers tried something different with a fuller projection that unfolds Ooh. the earth and ends up with a completely different orientation without distorting anything. That's really cool, but that would be very difficult to follow in that unfolded fashion. I, I don't know. Like, it's really cool, though. Um, <laughs> I I look at that and I'm just like, I don't know what even to make of that. I It takes me a second to even realize, oh, there's my continent. Uh, but I, I think it's so cool. Maps are awesome. Projection that unfolds the earth and ends up with a completely different orientation without distorting anything. This map doesn't have Greenland at the very top of the map, like we might be used to. There's more than one way to represent Earth. By thinking about mm. what a map was supposed to be used for, we can spot these obvious or not so obvious choices made by cartographers. A lot of map stuff uh, ends up getting, uh, a, a, a lot of it's very political. Um, historically, the, uh, the British have a lot of influence on how maps have been drawn in the Western world, uh, because a lot of it comes from that particular region. So they end up being like dead center. So I think that's kind of fun to, to think about. Like, why is everything arranged the way that it is? Uh, who was drawing it? For centuries, humans have been using maps as navigational tools to help us understand our physical surroundings. Stick charts like these are made of fibers from coconuts and shells oh, that cool. were developed by mariners from the Marshall Islands. These charts weren't used to navigate exactly the same way that we use maps today. They weren't carried along in the boats, but studied and memorized to get a better idea of the islands, waves, winds, and currents in the Pacific Ocean. Stick charts were personal. Mariners had their own stick charts that they used to get back to the places they'd visited. Kind of like my mental map to my favorite coffee shop. Mm. These charts were someone's own perception of the space in their individual world. Maps can also be used politically, and the choices about where to draw borders on a map are giving spaces a national identity. For I guess the uh, the exact accuracy of a map like that wouldn't uh, need to be as close if you're living like maybe in a series of islands that are relatively close to one another. You could follow it and have it be a little bit off and still find it. Uh, pretty well so like i i really like that and it, it has that mental factor to it i think that's really cool for example i'm so excited about maps. territory in antarctica and some nearby islands that's currently on pause thanks to a 1959 treaty originally the 12 countries whose scientists had been conducting research on the continent signed and agreed that no activities taking place would mean they'd claimed the territory but in the 1960s despite the treaty argentina published maps claiming territory in antarctica so anyone who uses hmm. those maps would perceive this land as part of Argentina. But where to draw borders isn't the only political decision a cartographer can make. I've seen uh, maps of uh, Antarctica that show the different people that have different countries that have claimed different parts of it. And it really is just like slices of pizza. It's really interesting to see. And I've talked about it in the past. Antarctica is going to be very important. Maybe not in my lifetime, but in the future uh, when we exhaust a lot of our, our uh, oil options. Because there's a lot of oil in Antarctica. And if they start really working on ways to efficiently get oil out of there, I don't know where they are with that. But uh, there may be a significant rush to... Uh, uh, assert these claims to Antarctica. Let's go to the thought bubble. Let's say it's the 1950s and we're U.S. cartographers working on a new world map. The Cold War between the United States and the Ugh. Soviet Union is nearing its height and the tension can influence our map making decisions. First, we have to choose a kind of projection, like the Mercator projection. First made in 1569 by the Flemish cartographer Gerardus Mercator, this type of map basically turns the spheroid Earth into a cylinder. The Mercator projection shows the lines of longitude, or meridians, as equally spaced and parallel vertical lines traversing pole to pole. The lines of latitude, or parallels, are also parallel lines on this map, but get spaced farther apart as we move north or south of the equator. Hmm. On a globe, meridians aren't equally spaced, but curve together at the poles. With this layout, the scale gets distorted and areas farther away from the equator appear bigger than they really are. Like, look at hmm. Greenland. 
It's essentially the same size as all of Africa. It's not that this- Yeah, that's what I was saying. Like Africa gets, it really gets the shaft in maps like this. I didn't know like the term for it, but now I do. Uh, that's really, that's really interesting. And you may think that it's completely political, maybe to a degree, there may be something political behind it, but it's generally just difficult to, uh, to fit everything onto, uh, this rectangular surface in an efficient way. So I can understand why some things would happen to get morphed, but this feels weird. Like th the modern day United States, it looks like it's about the size of Africa when you can fit maybe three of them into it. Don't quote me on the exact numbers, but I'm pretty sure it's like close to three at least, maybe. This representation is wrong. Every map choice comes with its flaws. But by choosing a Mercator projection, the USSR looks large and menacing. That's just the beginning. So we sketch out country borders, and now it's time to add color. As US-based cartographers, red is our first choice for the USSR. In the West, red, or the Red Scare, are synonymous with fear of communism. Representing a major foe to the United States in red sends an immediate message to the viewer. Red does look effects, like a bad guy color. Let's add the hammer and sickle, weapons reminiscent of the scythe of death and the symbol of the Soviet era, which evoked fear in Americans. As you can see, with just a few map-making choices, we can actually help stir up some major nationalistic emotion. Thanks, Thought Bubble. Though the Cold War is over, our maps still reflect nationalistic fervor in more modern times. We like to think of data and numbers as being objective, but how data is displayed on maps can affect what people believe about the world. Like these hmm. two maps both show the Hispanic population in Florida based on the 2000 census. They look like very different maps, but it's actually the same data. Maps can even be used to tell stories about- Hold on, I, I didn't get a very good look at that. Okay, like it, hmm. Okay, so it, it just, like shifts the numbers that the colors happen to represent. Yeah, that could make a huge difference there. Uh, electoral maps are very messy. I've seen so, some very wonky looking uh, uh, electoral maps. I, I wonder if they would, uh, if they're, they'll ever do something like related to that, like maybe a thing on gerrymandering. I don't know if that's the best one to do for uh, geography. Maybe that's a... Uh, a political science one or something like that, but I think gerrymandering is a very interesting topic when you are talking about maps. They look like very different maps, but it's actually the same data. Maps can even be used to tell stories about societal problems. On this map, major chemical accidents, environmental disasters, freak weather patterns, and deforestation are all included with different symbols. Hmm. So looking at this map might make you feel like the Earth experienced great environmental stress in the 1980s and 1990s. And that's a choice the cartographer made. Maps can make strong arguments because they pull a lot of visual information together, which can increase our awareness about certain issues or greatly skew our understanding of the world. Maps are powerful tools, and they'll be a crucial part of our journey through geography. But we can't rely on just one map. Every map is telling a particular story with how it's visualizing data, and it's our job to think critically about what's being presented to us. Many maps and borders represent modern geopolitical divisions that have often been decided without the consultation, permission, or recognition of the land's original inhabitants. Many geographical place names also don't reflect the indigenous or aboriginal people's languages. So, so this seems to be something they, they put this at the end of the, uh, the last one too, right? I think they did. So th this is going to be like a running thing. Okay. We at Crash Course want to acknowledge these people's traditional and ongoing relationship with that land and all the physical and human geographical elements of it. We encourage you to learn about the history of the place you call home through resources like nativelands.ca and by engaging with your local indigenous okay. and aboriginal nations through the websites and resources they provide. Thanks for watching this episode of Crash Course Geography, which was made with the help of all these nice people. If you'd like to help keep Crash Course free for everyone forever, please consider joining our community on Patreon. All right, so that's uh, Crash Course Geography number two. I think at the point I'm recording this, they have eight of these. I might be able to, if I do one or two a week, I probably won't do more than one a week, but I don't know. If I do one or two a week, um, I, I should be able to catch up, no problem. They have so many different courses that I'm very interested in because I've dabbled into all sorts of different social studies uh, not just history, and since the channel is Social Stud, I would like to uh, broaden it to not just be history. I wanted to, I, I want to learn about like all kinds of social studies. Geography just happens to be the one I'm, I'm on right now. I, I'm very into geography as is.
Um, if any of you have any other geography creators, I've gotten some suggestions so far, but if you have any that you think I should check out, leave them in the comment section below. Like, comment, and subscribe, and I will see you guys next time. We're going to be doing more geography. Very exciting. Um, yeah, thanks for watching. Bye.